Hi there. These are my comments on Rebel Wisdom Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance Book Club with Jonathan Rousen. This book club is great, and this is the second case of Persig coming up on an influential channel in a short period of time. A few weeks ago, Robert Breedlove was on Lex Friedman, and he talked about Lila, and he also talked about Lila with uh, John Verveke in a couple of their many uh, dialogues. Jonathan Rousen did a really nice job. It's obvious he loves this book, as does David Fuller. And if thinkers of this caliber like this book so much, that's good news. Interestingly, Rousen has a project going on called the Perspectiva Project, or the Perspectiva, which is contributing to the philosophical and spiritual way forward that we need. I don't see that Rousen has yet talked to John Verveke, so I hope he does. So I want to comment a little on this presentation. Around 15 minutes into the video, Rousen says that systems have souls and emotions and epistemologies. If you look at this through the Persigian lens, this makes sense because everything is striving towards what is good, which manifests in the metaphysics of quality is freedom. Everything is striving towards freedom. And this means there's an element of panpsychism in Persig's theory, because anything that has movement, meaning any atom or any galaxy or any microbe or any cell or any tiger or any pauper or any king is always moving towards liberation or trying to maintain that hard-earned liberation. The pauper wants to overcome his, his financial position and the king wants to protect his power. The atom wants to connect with other atoms because they can get more done that way. And apparently the galaxy is expanding. As I've indicated in other videos, I think the comparison to McGilchrist is apt. And I'm basing this on the master and his emissary because I haven't read the second book that Rousen refers to. But McGilchrist's theory is another way of observing the same phenomenon of classic and romantic. It's probably more precise in Persig in the sense that this is McGilchrist's entire theory, and the book is 500 pages long, and there's a lot of science in it. And the theory is about the difference between the two systems of thought, you could say, or systems of understanding or perception. Whereas Persig sets these up as the essential conjugate of quality in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. He'll re later reject this division in favor of dynamic and static quality, but the two modes of thinking or consciousness or perception are absolutely real and line up with McGilchrist and remain very high quality patterns of value with a solid footing in the biological level, I would say. I've heard Phaedrus pronounced Phaedrus and Phaedrus, but I have to say this is the first time I've heard it pronounced Phaedrus. I'm probably saying it wrong, but that's how the voice actor, um, or Phaedrus, the way I say it, is how the voice actor Michael Kramer pronounces it in the audiobook. I'm a big fan of that audiobook. So Rousen thinks Phaedrus was too analytical to get to the bottom of his metaphysics, that he hit a block, and I think that's right. His rationality ran out, and I love the way that Rousen frames that. The book discusses where rationality runs out, where it, is, it stops being useful, and another way of understanding has to come into play. As the memory of Phaedrus emerges, Robert, the protagonist, is working with him to develop something usable, I guess you could say. And in a way, it's Robert's regular guy insight that's behind the gumption Chautauqua and, in fact, the development of the metaphysics of quality, riffing off of the hard work that Phaedrus has done. I think one way to look at it, and I don't think there's only one right interpretation, obviously, of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, there are only quality interpretations, is that Phaedrus can trust Robert to respect his work, and now Robert can trust Phaedrus not to blow it by ending up back in the psych ward, which is roughly what Rousen says. I want to, with the utmost respect to Rousen, expand on 
one question, which is, what is Persig's notion of development, or does he have a developmental theory? And this particular question is important to rebel wisdom because a developmental approach is key to understanding how people can transcend the meaning crisis. A lot of the people who come on the rebel wisdom channel have a developmental understanding of human psychology and spirituality, and it's part of Wilbur's approach and Wilbur is a big influence uh, on the Rebel Wisdom channel. What I would say is Persig does have something like a developmental model. It's not a stage model, as they typically are. It's more of a layering model, you could say, or more of a, a, a being in a particular state is good and being out of that state is bad. And this, this goes along all stages of human development. And Rousen touched on the evolutionary level. So in one sense, that part of the metaphysics of quality is a developmental philosophy, the development of the universe that means something to us, you know, from the Big Bang onward, the great chain of being. Also, because Persig's philosophy is a metaphysics, you can actually map the metaphysics of quality onto any psychological or philosophical or spiritual or intellectual endeavor and view it through this metaphysical lens. Therefore, it can certainly map onto human development theories. Keegan, who Rousen said he studied with, says that development or transformation is a personal Copernican shift. And then Rousen says that you have this shift after, he says something like, after you read this book, you have this shift of understanding. And that's a way, great way of describing your metaphysical understanding from an object-oriented metaphysics to value-based metaphysics, from subject-object metaphysics, as Persig calls it, to the metaphysics of quality. In chapter 11, Persig explores the route that Fiedrich took towards developing his philosophy. And at one point, he is developing this through the lens of academic Western philosophy, specifically Hume and Kant. The example he gives is that of Hume, and it's a developmental question, that a child who is completely sense-deprived will not develop and will not have a thought in his head. That is true according to Hume, but according to Kant, there's a built-in discernment mechanism so not having a thought in your head can't be true because you have this a priori discernment. We're born with a set of features akin to common sense, let's say, like perception of time, for example. In the metaphysics of quality, both are true, and each is reflected in a feature of the metaphysics of quality. The empirical nature of knowledge is related to dynamic quality in some sense, and Kant's a priori are not a set, set of features, they are social patterns that Im, are imparted on us through, and I'm going to use this word in a neutral sense, indoctrination, first by our mothers and then by society at large. In chapter three, he discusses how an empirical phenomenon that humans experience, which is things drop to the ground, is socialized in us through the ghost of Newton, the law of gravity, Persig says. So John Sutherland asks Robert, why does everybody believe in the law of gravity then? Mass hypnosis, in a very orthodox form known as education. You mean the teacher is hypnotizing the kids into believing the law of gravity? Sure, that's absurd. You've heard of the importance of eye contact in the classroom. Every educationist emphasizes it. No educationist explains it. So the way we experience the world through our senses is biological. And the way we understand that empirical material is social. And the way we put two and two together is intellectual. And this is the framework for the human being. All three levels are acting together all the time. So one aspect, and we'll get into this, I'll get into this in a minute, is that are these three levels working together or are they at odds with each other? Optimal development is them working together, being stuck or... Um, or a barrier to development is them being out of sync is like operating for their own good and not for the good of the, the whole. In chapter nine of Lila, there is an explanation through the metaphysics of quality lens as to how a baby develops. And when a baby is first born, it is just a purely biological creature with nothing but raw experience. From a baby's point of view, something he knows not what compels attention. This generalized something, Whitehead's dim apprehension, is dynamic quality. The exact quote is a dim apprehension of he knows not what. 
According to Persig, kids who are developmentally disabled are so due to a low or no ability to have this dim apprehension to perceive of, dynamic, of, of quality. A normal baby, though, will soon have enough of these raw experiences perceived through, the, through this dim apprehension of dynamic quality that it is not until a baby is several months old that he will begin to really understand enough about that enormously complex correlation of sensations and boundaries and desires called an object to be able to reach for one. And that's a nice sentence because it is also a good description of how the experience of quality of dynamic quality creates objects through the experience of the subject. After that, the mother will guide the child to understand and categorize these objects. And this is the basis for understanding and cognitive development and also describes where Kant's a priori comes from. Elementary static distinctions between such entities as before and after and between like and unlike grow into enormously complex patterns of knowledge that are transmitted from generation to generation as the mythos, the culture in which we live. In terms of ongoing psychological and spiritual development beyond those early years, you might look at it as cultivating an ability to connect with quality. The gumption Chautauqua is about avoiding psychological traps to that, and as Rousen says, traps that make you lose your enthusiasm. Psychological development, or health, let's say, and enthusiasm for life are deeply entwined. If you lose your enthusiasm, you become stuck. If this lack of enthusiasm sticks around for too long, you will cease progressing. So it can be a big problem. It can be a major barrier to development. Spiritual development is the same as psychological development because in metaphysics, the practical and the spiritual follow the same path. In fact, the metaphysics underlies all again, all elements of what it is to be a human being. In terms of the levels, the biological, the social, and the intellectual, it's where they all line up and work together. You could be able to be in that dynamic space where you are creating quality analogs based on your static patterns, chapter 24 of, of ZAM, more rather than less and being in that space points to optimal and psychological and spiritual development. And I'm going to quote the conclusion of the Gumption Chautauqua here. This is chapter 26, by the way. The making of a painting or the fixing of a motorcycle isn't separate from the rest of your existence. If you're a sloppy thinker, the six days of the week you aren't working on your machine, what trap avoidances, what gimmicks can make you all of a sudden sharp on the seventh? It all goes together. It all lines up harmony. But if you're a sloppy thinker six days a week and you really try to be sharp on the seventh, then maybe the next six days aren't going to be quite as sloppy as the preceding six. What I'm trying to come up with on these gumption traps, I guess, is shortcuts to living right. The real cycle you're working on is the cycle called yourself. The machine that appears to be out there and the person that appears to be in here are not two separate things. They grow toward quality or fall away from quality together. So that's a nice sentence to explain what the metaphysics of quality or this approach or Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance is trying to guide you towards. And in guiding you towards quality, this will layer on itself. And this is your trajectory. Rousen indicates in several ways that the heart of Persig's philosophy is being in that space of seeing reality as it, in, as it really is, as it, un, as it unfolds magically before you, which is another way of stating the opening of the gumption Chautauqua. The gumption filling process occurs when one is quiet long enough to see and hear and feel the real universe, not just one's own stale opinions of it. At about eight minutes into the book club, Rousen says that Persig was ahead of his time. Well, I agree with that. And I propose that the time, though, is now. So I encourage anyone watching this to jump on the train and let's ride the track of quality together. And I am referring to a great metaphor, the train metaphor in Chapter 24, Zenith, the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. So I hope that makes sense, and I will see you next time.